Shalom and welcome to yet another episode of TV7 Times Observer. I'm Jonathan Hassan, and joining me all the way from Galilee is my brother in Christ and dear friend, Amir Tzalfati. Amir, how are you today? Shalom, Jonathan. I'm, I'm well, thank you. I'm well rested, back from the British Isles, ready to serve. Wonderful. Well, hopefully uh, the weather is a bit uh, chillier than uh, the heat here in Jerusalem. It was much chillier. We had rain, we had fog. It was wonderful. We felt like we were on a different planet when we were there, but uh, we got back to the hottest week in our whole year. So Indeed. Well, we feel the same here down in Jerusalem. But uh, how about we open uh, today's program in prayer, and yes. then we'll dive into the different topics that we uh, deliberated prior to the show. No problem. Father, we thank you so much for uh, everything that... Uh, is going on around us. We know that you're in full control. You're sitting on the throne and you wish that all will come to the saving knowledge of the Messiah. Father, we know that there are things that are happening around us that we find them hard to understand, but knowing that you are in full control is giving us a lot of comfort and, and security. Father, we ask that today through this program, more people will find comfort, encouragement, and, and wisdom to understand the times and seasons in which we live. We thank you and we bless you in the name of our precious Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, Amir, I, I want to believe that we're all aware, uh, wherever we may watching uh, from right now, um, the tough and challenging situation. Uh, respectively, all over the world. Uh, countries are struggling, uh, whether it be uh, fiscally, economically, uh, there's inflation uh, from the United States to Europe to uh, Asia and, and going down to Australia and also here in Israel, obviously, and, and Africa. Um, the silver lining that God is still in control. Uh, nevertheless, we'll try to identify today uh, the variables, and uh, how about we start with the Word of God and see um, a little bit of, of uh, what occurred back in the days uh, which yes. were recorded in, in the Word, uh, and how we can apply them also for today uh, in the current realities that we're living in. Uh, how about we all turn to Zechariah, chapter 9, Zechariah yes. Perek mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tet. And uh, we will try and, and to identify this if you would like to read oh. this uh, chapter and, and uh, provide us with some insight okay. uh, of no what problem. the Lord put I'll, in your heart. Yes, I'll read uh, Zechariah chapter 9. We'll, I'll, I'll start. The burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach and Damascus its resting place. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. Also against Hamat which borders on it, and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. For Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust, and gold like the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful, and a Koron, for he dried up her expectation. The king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. But he who remains, even he shall be for our God, and shall be like a cedar, a leader in Judah, and Ekron like a Jebusite. I will camp around my house because of the army, because of him who, pos who passes by and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them, for now I have seen with my eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the, and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow uh, shall be cut off. 
end shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the restless, from the, excuse me, from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you, for I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow with the flame, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them. They shall devour and subdue with sling stones and shall drink and roar as if with wine. And they shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them in that day and the flock of his people. For they shall be like the jewels of, the, of a crown, lifted like a banner over his hand, over his land. For how great is its goodness and how great its beauty. Grain shall make the young man thrive, and new wine, the young woman. Amen, amen. I mean, it, it's obviously beautiful, especially uh, um, the part where we obviously see that these are prophecies that came to pass already, uh, also particularly the prophecy about Jesus um, with regard to riding a donkey uh, yes. and coming into uh, the city of Jerusalem. I'd like to hear your insight on this, as uh, obviously uh, we see here the connection between Lebanon and, and uh, Gaza. Today there is that uh, analogy, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad are quite close together. Um, and they are working together. Just this past uh, or earlier this month, uh, there was uh, a meeting between uh, uh, Ziad al-Nahala, the leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan al-Salah, uh, both of them puppet leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran that seeks the demise of the uh, Jewish state of Israel, the, the apple of God's eye. How do you see this uh, mm. from that day? coming into that point where God ultimately proclaimed the name of the Lord through all those challenges, through all this strife, mm. God was still in control and his word yeah. was manifested. Well, Jonathan, first of all, we must acknowledge the fact that the conflict against Israel, the conflict with Israel is a spiritual conflict to begin with. If we take the spiritual aspect from it, we, we actually remove the only way for us to understand what is really going on here. From the very beginning, from the get-go of the people of Israel as a nation, as they left Egypt, it was Pharaoh that tried to kill them, the Amalekites that tried to kill them, and the, uh, uh, you know, the Aramites, uh, all of them that, uh, if, if you think about it, and then they entered into the land, and then the Philistines tried to invade and kill them, and then other nations would come and invade, and eventually, the Syrians and the Babylonians and the Greek and the Romans and in, before that the Persians. Look, there was not a single time in history where Israel was not a nation that was persecuted by enemies all around it. And the, the reason is very simple. That which is of God, from God, is that which the enemy of God hates. And that that is Islam is is a new religion, fairly new religion. It's you know we're talking about six, seven centuries that it started spreading. This is the will to destroy and utterly get rid of Israel is going all the way back to the Exodus from Egypt. It's nothing new. Now we can clearly see the Zechariah, not only Zechariah, Jeremiah did the same, and Isaiah did the same. He is writing a whole list of judgment that. God Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, he is going to execute that judgment upon those nations. Now, these nations are not being executed, I mean, that judgment is not being executed just because they are not Jews, they are not Israel. No, any nation that was standing with Israel, that was helping Israel, that was in favor of, of Israel was blessed. Any nation that stood up 
in order to replace the God of Israel, in order to replace the people of Israel, in order to take over, was judged. And that's the list of nations we see. The Philistines, we see that the king of Tyre and the king of Sidon, we see all of them listed here. You know, they, they, they say that the, the king of Tyre actually thought that he's God. I mean, he was so rich and the city that he had was so rich and was destroyed later on, of course, by Alexander the Great and others. But, but we know that the, at some point, wealth and strength and might of a nation makes the leader think that he is God. <laughs> and God is always executing judgment upon those. But then you see at the same time that God is executing judgments because of the sinful nature of mankind. He also provides a way for salvation. And that way, from verse 9 and on, you see, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, behold, your king is coming to you. The king of Israel, the real true king that will reign, as you can see, from the river to the ends of the earth, from sea to sea, is Jesus. And he will enter at first as a lowly servant, not riding a horse, but riding a donkey. But I will remind you, Jonathan, that in the book of Revelation, in chapter 21, he will re return also as someone who is riding uh, on a horse. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the, the Word of God, he will return and he will execute judgment once again, but this time as King of kings and Lord of lords that will not just reign from heaven, but will also physically reign from Jerusalem over the whole world. Very interesting indeed, and, and praise God for that. Uh, more so, I, I'd like to also uh, point out something, and, and this is something that just came to mind. Uh, the fact of the matter is, even when the kingdom of Israel and the Philistines fought each other um, uh, during the time of David, before he became king and before his anointment, um, we could see that within the historical context, the war between the Philistines and Israel was of a strategic nature. There were interests, both for Israel, both for the Philistines, of course, the historical context, we can research it from different angles. And then uh, what comes down to the fact is that within that strategic context, there was one individual that God ordained to come and overwhelm Goliath. And be that champion that ultimately yes. from his seed will come the Messiah, uh, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think that also today, once we look at the big picture uh, and we understand that we live in an age of strategic competition where the world powers are competing uh, for world resources, they're competing literally for Mammon for whoever can gain the most in order to satisfy the needs of that particular nation state. Now, of course, their strategic interests are at heart and they're thinking about how they can do so the best way. But ultimately, within this entire context, we know that Israel also plays a role. And within that role that Israel plays is not only the physical role, where it is playing in the camp, of course, of the West and the United States and uh, seeing the United States as a strategic uh, cushion for uh, strategic interests of national security of, of the state of Israel. But there is also the spiritual element that God utilized the inception of the state of Israel to basically validate the word of God and to say that also today in the 21st century, the word of God is eternal. It yeah. is not it is. just yesterday. It is today. It is the present of today and also the present of tomorrow. Yeah. And, and remember 3,000 years ago when, when we had David and we had the Philistines, remember the, the, the two nations, the Philistines and the Israelites, both entered the land of Israel from two sides. The Israelites were not originally there. They came from the east, entering through Jericho, the Philistines came from the West and think through the Mediterranean and Gaza. And yet one was the rightful owner and the other one is called the invaders. Philistine, plishtim, to invade. And up until today, we have the same issue of those now that return back from the West and those that are now coming all the way from other places in the 
late you know 1800s early 1900s and one is the rightful owner and one is the inverter yet the world is twisting it all around as if this one is the inverter and the other one is the rightful owner now we see that then we see that now because it is spiritual jonathan it is the same thing that's why i always enjoy reading old testament prophecies because whatever happened then happens today and every prophecy of the old testament has a dual meaning it, it talks about what happened then but it also has the meaning of what is to happen even in the future indeed well let's talk about uh, uh today's reality and and there are two quotes that i'd like to raise the first one uh is of prime minister Yair Lapid. and uh, if we put things in context of course uh we're talking about the imminent revival of the 2015 nuclear agreement uh, uh also technically referred to as the joint comprehensive plan of action uh, we see the various decision makers taking decisions that sometimes don't seem very logical to our minds uh, but regardless of whether an agreement is adopted or not ultimately uh, prime minister Yair Lapid has continuity in this line at least from his uh, predecessor naftali bennett and from the predecessor of naftali bennett prime minister or the former prime minister on uh, uh, benjamin netanyahu uh, where he says if an agreement is signed, it does not bind us. In reference to Israel, we're not a party to it, and it will not limit our actions. The IDF and the Mossad received an instruction from us to prepare themselves for any scenario. We will be ready to act to maintain Israel's security. The Americans understand this. The world understands this. Israeli society should also know this. Does Israeli society comprehend this as the rest of the world seemingly is? No, I, I think that the Israelis long ago lost any confidence in any deal with Iran. I believe that the, the Iranians are deceiving the world. They have deceived, they are deceiving, they will deceive. This is a, this is a, who they are. That's how they do things. They, and the one thing that I admire about the Iranians is that they have patience, which the rest of the world doesn't. They can wait and wait and wait. They will exhaust you in negotiations until you will do what they want. And indeed, almost everything they wanted. Look, what they did is they realized that <laughs> they realized that from the very get go of the Biden administration, many of the sanctions were already lifted. And so they already started doing business with so many uh, countries and therefore they raised up the, the 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 price that they were playing with the, their cards to the point that they thought well if let's see how much we can get and they could not believe how much both the europeans and the americans are willing to pay to get back to a deal that is not taking us back to 2015 jonathan in 2015 i wish we were in 2015 when they didn't have as much technology and as much enriched uranium as they have today. Look, this is something that even the head of the Israeli Mossad said, it's all big deception. He said it, not me. Of course, he embarrassed our prime minister because he should have probably not said that publicly, but he did. My point is, the Israelis don't bite. 90% of the Israelis understand this is a bad thing. We do not want to see happening. But again, as you said earlier before the show, uh, that America has a you know different uh, 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 different interest than Israel, and it sees things Indeed. in a broader way. Yeah. Well, to be fair, um, with regard to Mossad director David Barnea, who is a very capable individual, uh, uh, very upright, uh, and uh, uh, comes from the same unit originally that uh, both uh, the former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and. Uh, the head currently of the uh, internal security uh, um, or the internal security ministry uh, and, and many others uh, from the special unit, Sahar uh, Matkal, they all are from that same small uh, group, basically, and, and uh, very capable, uh, not only in, in decision making, but also in uh, discernment. Uh, he came out and, and he mentioned a few other things in his briefings to different journalists here in Jerusalem that ultimately, when we're looking at uh, this whole picture, 
uh, right now is uh, what we're dealing with. But uh, the Iranians uh, will have a certain period where strategically thinking or speaking, uh, the assessment is that they will not uh, particularly pursue uh, a nuclear weapon, at least not from that specific uh, uh, arm. Uh, something that Ta Tamir Hayman, the former intelligence director of the IDF, has also mentioned, and of course, they're not opening up on, on everything, oh. but there is a discussion about the respite. Now, uh, I'd like to quote Major General Tamir Hayman, who is still in reserve, of course, he still advises uh, the general staff on, on multiple matters of intelligence. And uh, he says as followed, uh, the United States is determined to enter this deal from its own considerations, which are significantly broader than Israel's considerations and concerns. It, in reference, of course, to the United States, has a domestic American interest and has interests in relation to the strategic power competition vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. Uh, it must invest resources in Europe and the war uh, in reference, of course, to Ukraine and Russia, and therefore closing the Iranian file for a period of at least eight years that will provide for time to prepare for a period of after the deal is a more important interest for the Ameri from the American perspective. Therefore, I think that Israel's influence over the agreement or signing is low. Would you agree with that assessment? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. But I'm not, look, I'm not a general and uh, I can, I can definitely, I must, you know, stay humble and, 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 and acknowledge the experience of these people. But everyone knows that the Iranians are bluffing everyone, including themselves. By the way, in, in June of this year, the Iranians, uh, I mean, there was an, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency received in a, a, a deck or, or passed a resolution that condemns Iran for at least three cases where we, they found particles of uranium in undeclared sites and the Iranians could not until this moment provide any explanation to what uranium was doing there. And now the Iranians are saying we will come back to the deal if that investigation will be closed. In other words, you caught us, but we need you to ignore it in order so we can move forward. Look, I want to take you back to the moment when General Soleimani was assassinated. The whole world was always under this, this thinking that if that such a thing is going to happen, there will be a world war. What actually you got is a very shocked and frightened and scared Iranian regime that could not do anything. And in fact, they were so humiliated that they actually even declared that even after we sign a deal with the US, we reserve the right to execute vengeance against those who plotted against Soleimani. Now, my point is that when you are decisive and you strike where it needs, where you need to strike, they fear. When you try to somehow drag your feet and buy more time, you just give them more time, and that's the time they want. They need the time to finish working on whatever they do and to continue to uh, you know, cover up. And, and look, I have no doubt that they already have what they need. I just, I'm amazed that, uh, that you know, Europe and America are willing to live with it. I don't think Israel is willing to live with it. And I think that uh, when even Prime Minister Lapid when he said that the IDF and the Mossad received instructions and the head of the Mossad said that his organization knows how to remove that threat. He said that, not me. Israel will have to deal with that because uh, this agreement is only giving a kosher stamp for Iran to do what it wants. Well, very briefly, um, I agree with most of what you said. Um, particularly with the United States uh, wanting, however, to focus, as we all know, at the beginning of the Biden administration, there was a continuation, a posture review of where all the assets should be, uh, uh, or military assets, defense assets, uh, should be placed where the investments should go to. And there was a long time the discussion of the pivot eastward 
focusing on China. Uh, of course, uh, the Russian angle is an angle that the United States might not have anticipated necessarily. Uh, nevertheless, it was looking for options to uh, bolster or to push Europe into uh, becoming more capable vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, as if the United States, the moment it has to contend with China, it would like to see, of course, uh, the various countries in Europe being able to contend with uh, the secondary threat, which is Russia. And then the third threat, particularly Iran, would have to be a certain constellation in which Israel, the GCC, or the moderate Muslim uh, countries, including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, even Egypt within the constellation should find a certain cooperation in order to contend with that threat. So we can see a little bit of the U.S. mindset within this context that may trigger various yeah. developments that could then come in line with... Colossal. Uh, yeah, colossal failure on all ends. The U.S. failed in Afghanistan. It failed with the, the Chinese in Taiwan. It failed in Russia and the Ukraine. It fails with Iran. It's a colossal failure in every foreign policy of this administration. And so for me, and by the way, I'm not surprised it, because for, for me, when I look at the Bible, I clearly see that Israel will not get any help from America in the coming big war that the Bible predicts. And for that to happen, Jonathan, America has to either turn against Israel, which I find it probably unrealistic, or America will no longer be such a prominent world leader that is able to even, uh, you know, go and help Israel militarily. Indeed. Well, unfortunately, it is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Amir so much for uh, you partaking in today's uh, episode. And uh, we will discuss uh, this and, and many other uh, topics uh, of, of relevance to today um, uh, in our episode next month. Uh, but the silver lining, God is in control. So uh, praise God for that. Uh, thank you so much, Amir. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you. Uh, of our uh, brothers and sisters watching us from all over the world today. And uh, God bless, shalom, and we will see you next month for yet another episode of TV7 Times Observer. Shalom. <laughs>